Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman here in our Northwest Side studio. And I'm Paris Schutz coming to you live from my home. On the show tonight. What an opportunity we have here. The public gets its first true look at developers' plans for a Chicago casino. Utility giants will no longer sell sensitive information like data from phone bills to immigration officials. Some of the retailers downtown in Michigan Avenue, I will tell you, I'm disappointed that they're not doing more. How retailers are responding to retail theft crime wave across major cities, including Chicago. But the people, the people are just great. Southside residents are coming together for the holidays. We visit Grand Boulevard for our In Your Neighborhood series. I'm Angelito, and coming up tonight, I'll introduce you to a Chicago performer who's marking her start on Broadway. Rogers comes back to the left, wide open is Jones. Coming off a tough loss to the Packers, the Bears face the playoff hunting Minnesota Vikings. And Brandis, as you mentioned, I'm in Grand Boulevard as part of our Chicago Tonight in Your Neighborhood series. Now, this area includes part of the Bronzeville neighborhood, and it has a very rich history from its churches to its hospital. We speak to community leaders about that and their efforts to bring people together for the holiday season. But first, I send it back to you. Joanna, thanks. We'll see you soon. We'll check in with you and Paris later in the show. But first, some of today's top stories. Evanston Township High School went on an emergency lockdown today. Two guns were confiscated from inside the high school after Evanston police were called in to deal with kids caught smoking marijuana in the bathroom. Police say there was no active shooter, no shots were fired, and no injuries were reported. Other Evanston schools went on soft lockdowns to be safe, including King Arts, Joseph E. Hill Education Center, and Dewey Elementary. Police took eight people into custody, and then officials let students out for the day after the all-clear at 1240 this afternoon. The high school has canceled all after-school extracurriculars, including sports and clubs, until December 23rd. Chicago's COVID-19 vaccine mandate is upheld for most city employees. An arbitrator ruled that Chicago's firefighters and other employees, city employees, must be vaccinated. A separate arbitration set to take place before December 31st will determine whether police officers represented by the Fraternal Order of Police Lodge 7 must be vaccinated. Under the ruling, employees who fail to get the vax or do not receive an exemption for religious or medical reasons by the 31st will not be paid. The decision applies to Chicago employees represented by several different labor unions, including Chicago Firefighters Union Local 2 and Teamsters Local 700. A retired judge clears Mayor Lightfoot of wrongdoing in the botched police raid on Anjanette Young. The mayor brought in the law firm Jones Day to conduct the investigation, which found Lightfoot did not purposefully conceal information about the February 2019 raid that left Young handcuffed and pleading for help. But retired Judge Ann Williams did find, quote, failures in oversight and accountability by each of the four city departments charged with responding in the aftermath of the raid that touched off a political firestorm. The probe took over 9,000 hours and dozens of lawyers interviewed more than 40 current and former city employees and reviewed 250,000 city documents. All that in the subsequent 165-page report was conducted at no cost to the city. On the other hand, older people agreed to settle with Anjanette Young for $2.9 million during yesterday's city council meeting. Up next, first looks at a potential Chicago casino. Stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. Casino developers are finally showing their cards. The public got a look today at what a Chicago casino might look like and where it might go. It's an attraction city officials have been working on for some time. Amanda Venicky joins us with the latest. Amanda, how long has the city been betting on this? Well, Brandis Chicago has been betting, buying for a casino, really trying anyway, for decades. And now that it is finally getting close to reality, the city has to make a choice. 
which team of developers will get to build and operate this casino, a lucrative opportunity, and where in the city will that casino be located? It is a high-stakes gamble. The city needs the casino to be as successful as possible because that means more money in for the city's pockets to pay down long-term police and firefighter pension debt. Chicago weighing five options. Bally's proposes a casino at the current Chicago Tribune Publishing Center site. Also, Bally's a truck marshalling area that's just south of McCormick Place. Now, Rivers Casino also looking at McCormick Place, specifically looking to rehab the Lakeside Center building. Rivers has a second bid to be part of the under development neighborhood the 78 and that is a vacant area near the south loop now meanwhile hard rock all in for one location the proposed one central development that's across usaba lakeshore drive from soldier field now we have known since late october that these were the five proposals that the city received when it cast a really wide net for pitches but this is the first deeper view of what those projects that did submit will entail residents interested enough to RSVP in advance and then to sit through an entire afternoon of hearings really going into the evening just wrapping up had the opportunity to hear from each of these would-be developers who tried to single out their project as unique. Hard Rock team says there's one reason they put forth a single proposal, and that's because it is the chance for true connectivity. One Central aims to be a transit hub area, so visitors from the city and nearby regions could easily get to the casino complex, leaders say, and also then to Chicago's other attractions. Developer Bob Dunn says, think of it like how Disney World is successful because it makes it easy for people to get there and to visit. How do you take a must-see world-class destination that drives visitation and use that as a driver to create economic gain that can have an impact and a reach throughout the community. While there are five excellent proposals on the table today, there is only one that can truly meet the underlying theme of that overarching objective. Each proposal also put up their bona fides when it came to the diversity, equity, inclusion. But Hard Rock's partner, Jim Reynolds, says that most of those rely on limited partners who therefore have a limited stake and limited input. Hard Rock's, he says, is the only one where minority-owned firms like his are part of the general partnership. And he says that that should be a prerequisite. Chicago is about community. And this engagement and this investment and this casino is there to benefit Chicago, Chicagoans, and communities of Chicago. Engineer Kimberly Moore, also part of a bid, she is with Rush Street Gaming, wanting to build that Rivers Casino at McCormick Place Lakeside Center. When I think about the future of Chicago and the families on the south side, I want them to see that these investments are being made in their backyard. I want them to see what it's like to reimagine an existing building. It's being transformed into something spectacular, and it's being done by people in their communities. I'm excited about what this will mean for Bronzeville, for the south side of Chicago, and for all of Chicago. Backers say that this project could be up and running within only a year of receiving government approval, and that is a pretty quick turnaround. They say it's because it relies on an existing building, though that building is decaying, which means, again, more money for the city and sooner. Our bid provides the most economic benefit, $1.2 billion more than the other bids, an economic impact. Our location and the project we'll create is the most logical choice and will have the most impact on the entire Chicago economy. Rivers is owned by Chicago billionaire Neil Bloom, and critics say and they're worried that he's betting against himself, given that Bloom also owns Illinois' current best-performing casino, and that's the Rivers location in suburban Des Plaines. Bloom says that this is no time for the city to take chances and that his track record proves he can build a casino from the ground up and make it profitable. Now, meanwhile, you have Bally's trying to win over the public. Some residents are skeptical, skeptical about what brings 
bringing in any version of a casino from any of these backers could do to their neighborhoods. Concerns, for instance, about traffic and gambling addiction. Casinos, however, also do mean job opportunities, particularly for those who live nearby wherever one will be built. And Valley's likewise saying that it has experience. It is also offering money up front to the city. Now that developers have laid their cards on the table, we can expect more questions to come, particularly from members of the city council. Mayor Lori Lightfoot says that she expects the city will show its hand, making its choice, that is, on its favored pick by the end of March. With that, Brendis, back to you. Okay, Amanda, thank you. And now, Paris, back to you. Thanks, Brandis. Utility giants have agreed to stop selling sensitive information to Immigration and Customs Enforcement and other law enforcement agencies. Now, for years, companies have sold data from cable, phone, and power bills, including names, home addresses, and more. This move comes after pressure from Oregon Senator Ron Wyden and a national No Tech for Ice campaign. Supporters say it's a win, but some loopholes remain, including here in Chicago. And joining us to discuss the recent developments and those remaining loopholes are Nicole Hallett, Associate Clinical Professor of Law at the University of Chicago and Director of Immigrants' Rights Clinics, and Cynthia Rodriguez, an organizer for Mi Gente, a national and political and organizing hub for Latinx people. Uh, thank you both for being here. Cynthia, I want to start with you. Explain to us how utilities have been selling sensitive data and information of their customers to ICE and other federal agencies. Of course, thank you for having me. So I am Cynthia with the with Mi Gente. We lead the National No Tech for Ice campaign. And we've rung the alarm since 2018 that technology is being used for human rights abuses against immigrant communities. And so what we're seeing here is that for years, sensitive information like our names, home addresses, the people that we live with, and more has been put into the hands of ICE by utility companies and data brokers, right? Data brokers, the tech companies that collect this information. And in this case in particular, we're talking about a database run by the National Consumer Telecom and Utility Exchange, NCTUE. And so to break it down and how this works is that utility companies have people's personal information. Data brokers purchase that personal information and it becomes available for ICE, police, and federal agencies to access this information through various contracts. And so information is picked up from records like our phone bill, our cable bill, our internet bills, water, and more. And that information is sold and put into the hands of immigration enforcement. And, 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 and I'm sorry, then this has been perfectly legal up until some of the recent changes, which I want to get to in a bit. But Nicole, I want to bring you in here because uh, you did a study at the U of C that showed that despite Chicago being a sanctuary city where CPD is not supposed to share immigration status with ICE or federal agencies, there are some loopholes. Explain what those are. Sure, thank you for having me. So ICE gets information about people and data about people from all different sources. And so the the uh, the promise not to share utility information is extremely important, but that's just one avenue that ICE has used to get information. One of the very large avenues that they use all over the country is that they try to cooperate with local police departments to get information in the local police department's possession and then use that to find people, identify people and um, deport them. And so in Chicago, we have something called a welcoming city ordinance uh, that is supposed to prevent ICE from getting information from the city of Chicago that they're going to use to try to deport people. Uh, and in January of 2021, we, the city council just recently amended the welcoming city ordinance to make it uh, much stronger and to get rid of some of the loopholes. What we found in the study, however, is that because of the nature of surveillance and data, digital data today, and because there are there continue to be channels of information sharing between CPD and ICE, that despite the welcoming city ordinance, there are very often ways that ICE can get information about Chicago residents, even though that is supposed to be prohibited by the welcoming city policy. 
Okay, uh, and, and I want to get into some of that in, in a bit, but Cynthia, back to you. We mentioned that Senator Wyden from Oregon instituted some changes here. So what is different now with respect to these giant utilities and their ability to share this information with ICE and the federal government? So what we saw is that because of this victory, over 171 million people's utility information is blocked from being used by ICE to fuel the deportation and detention system. And so we're talking about a specific data set that can no longer be shared. And so when people are signing up to pay their phone bill, to pay their cable bill, they're not thinking that their information is gonna be placed into this enormous digital dragnet that can be passed along to ICE. And so for this particular set of data, that is no longer the case. But this is just one step, right? We're talking about the moment that we're living in is, is part of a big data economy. And so we still have a lot of work to do to make sure that information, as Nicole has described, does not continue to be used to harm our communities. So there still is data being shared. And Nicole, back to you. Uh, as I understand from your study, the CPD has cameras and other kind of surveillance information that it actually does share with ICE, despite this so welcoming city ordinance. Explain that for us. So CPD and ICE work together in collaboration um, at something called the Fusion Center. There are these fusion centers all over the country. There's one in Chicago. It's one of the oldest ones. And it's at this center that ICE can get access to any of the digital data that the city of Chicago collects about its residents. You mentioned, uh, you know, surveillance cameras. The city of Chicago has more surveillance cameras than any other city in the country. Uh, and now with facial recognition technology, that can tell the government a lot about where we are and what we're doing almost minute by minute throughout the day. Um, and so even though the welcoming city ordinance is supposed to prevent that information sharing, all ICE has to do is claim that there's some connection to a criminal prosecution and they can get around those restrictions and get a massive amount of data. And there are no checks to make sure that ICE isn't misusing um, that power to get information that they're going to use to try to deport people. So there's this loophole in the system that allows them to do that. Happening despite the fact that, as you mentioned, City Council tried to update uh, the Welcoming City Ordinance to get rid of loopholes. Cynthia, I want to go back to you. Uh, are there real world examples that you have of folks that uh, through the sharing of their utility information, phone bill, cable bill, what have you, that ICE found them and deported them? Definitely. And this is a campaign that came out of community members realizing that something was wrong, right? Something was wrong with the way that community members were being targeted very specifically. And so we know that sensitive information like utility bill information is shared with ICE because of our community members. That's how we know how dangerous this practice is. So one of our members is Maru Mora Villalpando, co-founder of La Resistencia in Washington State, where folks organize against detentions and deportations. And she was placed into removal proceedings and in FOIA requests, a Freedom of Information Act request, and in her lawsuit, she began to paint this picture that showed that she was retaliated against by ICE for her organizing. That's how she became placed into removal proceedings. In fact, ICE had tracked her internet presence, obtained information about her through data brokers. And so that's how dangerous the practice is. So it seems uh, more efforts uh, on behalf of uh, your group here and, and Nicole, yours as well. And we thank you both uh, for joining us. Uh, Nicole Hallett, Cynthia Rodriguez, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And Al Brandis, we go back to you. Paris, thank you. Located on Chicago's south side, the Grand Boulevard community is home to several historic institutions. The area is also known to many for its Bronzeville neighborhood. As part of our Chicago Tonight in Your Neighborhood series, reporter Joanna Hernandez and producer Marissa Nelson spent the day there speaking with community and business leaders about what they're doing to uplift the area. Joanna joins us now with more. Joanna. Brandis, everyone we spoke to had a story to tell about someone or a place that has made an impact on them here in this community. The Ebenezer Church, the 
Eb Ebenezer Church, Baptist Church, is one of those places. A Chicago, it's a Chicago church that has been here for nearly 120 years. Many influential people have passed through the church, especially during the Civil Rights Movement, like Martin Luther King Jr., not to mention the musical talent. This church is known as a birthplace of gospel music. Now the church is hoping to receive a $900,000 grant through a city program to help with repairs and renovations. It's going to go to the, the, uh, the roof, uh, tuck pointing, uh, HVAC things that we have, to, we have to repair or restore. It's a beautiful edifice. It's a beautiful edifice. It's acoustically perfect in here. Uh, and it's a treasure for Chicago. And we want to have this space available for the next generations of Chicagoans uh, to continue to do the work of ministry in, in, in our community. A few blocks from the church's prominent hospital. To give you a little background about the hospital, it has gone through several changes throughout the years. It's a Cook County hospital providing a significant amount of care to those who don't have a health insurance in the neighborhood. We spoke with Dr. Claudia Fagan, who is the chief medical officer there, and touched on the major medical developments happening there, including resuming ambulance runs. She also mentioned the concerns surrounding the holidays and COVID. Patients with COVID increasing, and we also have been seeing patients who come in who haven't gotten care, who have delayed care, who were hesitant to come out. And so the census for hospitals is, is very high. Uh, and uh, uh, Director uh, Izike for the Illinois Department of Public Health announced this morning that they will not allow hospitals starting tomorrow to go on bypass. Um, and we did this earlier in the um, pandemic. We're, they're going to do it again to make sure that uh, patients can get care and hospitals cannot turn anyone away. With Christmas around the corner and concerns over the Omicron variant, physicians and officials are asking people to not let their guards down. Elder woman Pat Dowell told us the Grand Boulevard community in her ward has one of the lowest vaccination rates. The zip code 60653, which is the Grand Boulevard community, uh, the number is below the 77 percent, close to the 66, 67 percent. So we have a ways to go. I think it's a lot of the millennials um, who have uh, misconceptions about the vaccine and probably uh, some of our seniors who have that same misconception. And as we know, businesses have been feeling the strain of the pandemic. We headed to Chicago's home Chicken and Waffles on King Drive. Owner Darnell Johnson opened the restaurant back in 2008 and says during the height of the pandemic, they were dealing with staff shortages but were, were able to stay afloat. We were ahead of the curve. Um, we had started third-party deliveries about seven years ago. We won a few who believed in it. Third party deliveries is a numbers game. If you're doing numbers, you make money. If you're not doing numbers, don't get into it. So we started way back. So when, it's, when, it, when the pandemic hit, we were right at the top of places where you call in to get food. And the customers have continued to pour in. Those that I spoke with told me it's the hospitality and, of course, the good food that brings them in. When our customers walk to the door, through the door, we tell them, welcome to our home. This is our home. And... In these doors, it's nothing but love, nothing but good people, supportive people. And, you know, when they come in, we, we show love to them, and we just treat everybody like with the utmost respect. So people love coming here, and it's, it's like a safe haven. And speaking of a safe haven, we're circling back to, to Pastor Person from Ebenezer Baptist Church. He shares that the church is an institution so of that we hope can face the challenge. with changes and challenges in the community. And now the what we're trying to say is that we need to equally uh, provide an emphasis of developing our spirituality so that we can face the challenges of this world. And because, you know, none of us get out of this experience unscathed and you need some sort of uh, foundation to to address the challenges that life will will undoubtedly bring. And as I mentioned, the church is getting ready to celebrate its 120th anniversary next year. And stay tuned. Next, we talk to an organization who took it upon themselves to bring some Christmas cheer to the neighborhood. But first, back to you.
And Joanna, congrats to the church on their uh, anniversary. And who's hungry after that visit to the Chicago home of chicken and waffles? Thanks, Joanna. We'll see you in a bit. Up next, a Chicago thespian makes her Broadway debut in Pretty Woman, the musical. Stay with us. Thousands of Puerto Ricans are taking to the streets to protest massive blackouts. Over the years, Mexican culture, from food to music, has become woven into the city's tapestry. Medical professionals share the latest recommendations on COVID-19 booster shots. DACA recipients have been facing longer delays than normal in their status renewal. Little Village is one of my favorite neighborhoods. This neighborhood comes together to celebrate such an important day in our culture. And there's much more ahead on the program, including a look at the recent surge in retail theft. But first, a Chicago artist has returned home to make her Broadway debut in a classic rom-com turned musical. Arts correspondent Angel Edo introduces us to a performer who tells us how she made it from the classroom to the stage. Just gonna give me directions? Sure. For five bucks. Pretty Woman is making a comeback, this time as a Broadway musical here in Chicago at the CIBC Theater. Director and choreographer Jerry Mitchell says he always felt the film was a modern day Cinderella story and evoked emotion that should be explored through song and dance. I thought to turn those into songs, if you get the right songwriter, could really be an exciting musical. And, and we found Brian Adams and Jim Valance, and I think they made incredible songs, especially the love song at the opera. It's just a beautiful number. The cast varies in experience, from veteran actors to Chicagoans making their national Broadway debut. Meet Alexa. It really is a true homecoming. I graduated from Northwestern in June found out that I got this job in July. It's an opportunity that came after what Alexa said felt like 100 no's. When I got the audition for this job, at the time I thought I would never get it because I was right out of school and I had no credits. There were people at the audition who had been on Broadway before and I recognized them because I had seen them on Broadway before. And um, I was like, wow, okay, this is, this is where we are, all right? Just gotta breathe. Once you like walk into the room, it's all the same work. And it was a really kind of actually calming experience to, to be able to really live that because I was like, oh, this is just what I went to school to do. Since hitting the stage, she's found herself grateful to receive insight from co-stars such as Adam Pascal. She's 22 years old, you know, I, and she's literally like, one, she could be one of my son's friends. She could be my son's girlfriend, you know what I mean? So, um, so I do feel a responsibility having the experience that I have after all the years that I've been doing this and um, to be a, um, some sort of, uh, uh, you know, mentor in that way. And, and, I, and I certainly don't treat it as something so literal, but I just try and act right. <laughs> you know, and, I, and, and hopefully if you act right, people around you right. say, okay, that's how you're supposed to do this. As for the parallels between the show and Alexa's journey, Olivia Valley, who plays Vivian Ward, says both are clearly the underdogs that come out on top. This is an underdog story as well as a Cinderella story. And so I think for people for the holiday season want to be whisked away by a beautiful story of two people falling in love, but also a story of this young woman finding her courage and her strength. I do what I know how to do. And, um, and it was cool to actually see that it's really not as scary as people make it out to be. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. And Pretty Woman, the musical runs through Sunday at the CIBC Theater. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, how a Southside-based organization is helping bring holiday cheer to King Drive. We talk with Jamal Cole of My Block, My Hood, My City. Some of the retailers downtown in Michigan Avenue, I will tell you, I'm disappointed that they're not doing more. A surge in retail theft is costing retailers who are calling on the city officials to crack down on crime. And with nothing to play for but pride, the Bears take on the playoff hunting Minnesota Vikings in prime time on Monday night. But first, some more of today's top stories. Cleanup continues from last night's storm as thousands are still without power. 
Commonwealth Edison reports more than 1,400 customers remain without electricity after 102,000 were initially impacted by the wild weather. The Weather Service says record high temps of 66 degrees preceded a cold front with high winds, which peaked at 74 miles per hour on Lake Michigan and 66 miles per hour at O'Hare. Illinois' richest man may have found a Republican to back for governor. The latest speculation is that two-term Aurora Mayor Richard Irvin is considering entering the 2022 governor's race and would have Griffin support. Griffin, a billionaire hedge fund manager, says he will put his considerable money behind a viable challenger to Democratic Governor J.B. Pritzker. But Griffin isn't officially showing his cards just yet. And more bears go down to COVID. All three coaching coordinators, offense, defense, and special teams, along with six more Chicago Bears players, including safety Eddie Jackson and receiver Allen Robinson, are now in COVID-19 protocols, which means the team now has 11 players out. The team is also dealing with non-COVID-related illness with seven other players. And we'll have more on how this will affect Monday's matchup between the Bears and the Vikings with James Big Cat Williams later on in the program, so stay tuned for that. And now back to Joanna Hernandez, who spent the day in Grand Boulevard as part of our In Your Neighborhood series. Joanna. Now, thanks, Brandis. Now, earlier today, we spoke with the founder of uh, My Block, My Hood, My City. His name is Jamal Cole. And I started by asking him about his organization. Take a listen. My Block, My Hood, My City is a, a social impact organization based out of Chatham. Our mission is to take care of people no matter what. If it's a snowstorm, we shovel snow for seniors. If it's a heat wave, we deliver water, deliver fans right to your door. Throughout the pandemic, we helped 8,000 seniors from 12 different states. We did contact tracing, connected them to primary health care physicians. Um, when small businesses started you know, um, hurting because of the pandemic, we raised $2 million on Instagram and gave it out to them. I literally will do anything to help out Chicago. We believe democracy starts from the block level outward instead of the city level inward. That's who we are. What made you want to start this? Um, just it's part of who I am. You know, I grew up, my dad was listening to Malcolm X so much. I thought, I watched that movie. I thought Denzel Washington was Malcolm X. I seen it so much. So I was like, when I get older, I want to be like that. And then just, just growing up and eating at shelters for Thanksgiving, I said, hey, who are these people with the white, the plastic gloves on? When I grew up, I want to be like them. Those are volunteers. And so when I graduated college, I started volunteering at Cook County Jail and at block clubs. So that's how I started it. Now I want to start, I want to move forward. Now this is the fourth year of M3's Be a Part of the Light program. Tell us about the initiative and why you started this. Yeah, I just got tired of seeing helicopter lights and police car lights and drone lights on King Drive, and I wanted to see some holiday lights. Um, there's nothing inspirational about, you know, ordering your food through bulletproof glass windows. There's nothing inspirational about um, seeing helicopter lights. So uh, to interrupt that trauma and to inspire hope, we start hanging holiday lights on homes and hanging holiday lights on poles, and that's what it did. It gives people hope. And you felt that? What was the reactions from the community? I mean, some people ain't never seen a Christmas tree their whole life. When they, they go trick-or-treating in the suburbs, they say they got the big houses over there, right? So when they see holiday lights and Christmas trees on Clean Drive, it, um, it makes kids curious. And when you're curious, that gives you hope. And so that's the, that's the secret to it. And you mentioned a little bit about what you were doing during the pandemic. Can you talk to me a little bit more about that? Yeah, there's no grants for what happens in a pandemic. Like, you got thousands of people reaching out and saying, how can I get PPE? How do I get hand sanitizer? How do we get food? So I just used Instagram. I went to Instagram and we raised two million dollars in one day. And so I took the money and spread it out to businesses that needed help with graffiti removal, glass repair, just just staying open and um and uh and pass the money out. So that's that's what we did. I mean, there's I'm not trying to be innovative, I'm just trying to help out. Now I do want to talk about what has happened to you back in September and recently right now. Can you've been open about your your trauma? You know, and, and can you just talk to me a little bit about that and just how important are mental health resources, you know, for the city, for this neighborhood? Yeah, we need publicly funded mental health services. And our, we need partners and local government that's going to help us with that. Like, I got shot on September 29th in my arm. The bullet is still in my arm, right? When I go to the airport, it goes off. I got shot at a month ago in Hyde Park on 53rd and Harper. Like, forget about me. The students got to go back to school like nothing happened. There's no counselors in the schools that they're going back to. There's one counselor per five. That's ridiculous, right? And so I'm not about to get up here and talk about, I hate the term gun violence. I think the way poverty and segregation contribute to gun violence is misunderstood in Chicago. Do you want me to get into it or just? That, well, that was my next question. Okay. My next question was, you know, asking you that you said you didn't like the term gun violence, no. you know? No. Why not? Well, because 
if a plane goes down, you're going to look at the black box and say, why'd the plane go down, right? Um, when somebody gets shot in Chicago, they say, oh, them people just shooting each other. No. Gun violence exists. It's a reflection of racial and economic injustice, high incarceration rates, high unemployment rates, poor neighborhoods, and under-resourced schools. When you have those five conditions, that's the perfect storm for gun violence. So the question isn't why is there so much gun violence. The question is why isn't there more gun violence? Because if you have those conditions, that's what it leads to. So to increase public safety, we need publicly funded mental health services. We need counselors in schools. And, um, and, and we need a partner in the federal government that's going to support nonprofits doing the work because we're putting up our own money right now to start programs. That's not fair. And coming up, we speak to a local leader from an organization and about their work that they're doing in the community. But first, I send it back to you. Joanna, thank you. A lot to learn there. At the height of the holiday season, retail stores in Chicago and across the country are experiencing a rash of thefts. Multiple in-store thefts have been recently reported on the Magnificent Mile, amounting to millions of dollars in stolen merchandise. But retailers say it's not just about the lost revenue, it's about safety. And they're calling for city officials to put more protections in place for businesses. Joining us to discuss the retail theft epidemic is Rob Carr, president of the Illinois Retail Merchants Association. Rob, welcome back. Thank you for joining us. So the businesses downtown, even in the suburbs, are experiencing uh, this surge in organized retail theft. What, uh, describe what it is that they're seeing specifically. Well, good evening, and, and I'm glad you worded it the way you did. It's a surge. Some people are trying to describe this as pandemic-related, and that's just not accurate. It's been around for a little over a decade is how long we've been working on it. It has increased 60% in the last five years. And really what we're saying is more brazenness, uh, more boldness on the part of the, the, the thieves. And we're seeing these in jurisdictions, frankly, where enforcement and prosecution uh, has waned in recent years. Uh, we're just That's what we're seeing, that boldness and that brazenness. Do you think because of uh, that, that boldness and brazenness comes from the fact that if you, as you say, you know, the prosecution, like there's just no deterrent. They're not being um, threatened with, uh, with repercussions. Well, that's really the only thing that has, has, has changed. And, and I think it's important to note, um, you know, that this is all connected. This is not organized retail crime funds a lot of other illicit activity. It, it funds human trafficking. It funds guns on our streets. It funds drug activity. Uh, basically anything you can think of. So it's all interrelated and it's far, I think too many leaders see it as simply an isolated event and it's all related and we have to address it comprehensively. What are retailers doing themselves to deter these crimes from happening? Yeah, great question. And I think it's unfortunate that some leaders have taken to blaming retail. You know, the old newscast that we see every day with this thing happening, read about it in the papers, hear it on the radio, uh, our, our eyes tell us that that just isn't true, right? We're seeing security camera footage. We're seeing them blow right past armed security guards. Uh, we're seeing them breaking glass cases and cutting chains. All of those kind of security measures that retailers have in place, they're doing those things. Um, so what we really need are our leaders to quit pointing fingers at each other and to engage with us in a cooperative fashion uh, to address uh, this and address it long term. It is not going to be, be a, a one and done fix. It's going to require a consistent approach. Criminals like weak targets, and right now, whether we like it or not, Chicago, like San Francisco, like New York, like Philadelphia, are seen as weak targets. So Illinois Attorney General uh, Kwame Raoul and his task force, they were able to recover more than a million dollars in stolen merchandise from storage units in Chicago. Um, do you think those kinds of crimes can be deterred by just increasing security and, you know, tougher prosecution? Well, we have increased security, but I, I certainly think a willingness to uh, to uh, address it more comprehensively. It's not going to be just that. It has to be more than that. And I think, you know, we need to, to address online. Uh, we address a few other factors, and Irma will be coming out in the very near future with our suggestions on how to approach that uh, comprehensively. We have been a part of, since its inception, the Attorney General's task force. Uh, I speak with him and his staff frequently. We appreciate the leadership he's taken, and I think it's instructive that of all our leaders, he indeed has embraced it and understand it for what it is, which is an, a comprehensive organized problem that will take a coordinated approach. Okay, and of course, when you say online, you mean some of the, the stolen goods being resold, repurposed online. Um, now, according to National Retail Federation, retail thefts are costly to re retailers, making the average revenue price $700,000 per billion dollars in sales. Another finding shows in 2019, 29% of retailers reported a revenue loss of $1,000. In 2020, that number rose to 50% of retailers reporting that. Um, Rob, how will this economic performance impact the retailers? 
Well, I think it, it's not only just how it impacts the retailers, but let's let's talk about that. It impacts the retailers because every item that is stolen we puts more pressure on the existing items to sell. We have to make up our margin, whether it's in property taxes, wages and benefits, all the costs that go into the price of the retail product have to be made up in additional sales, which is very hard to do. The sales pie is only so big. But I think it's also important to note, it's not just the retailer who's the victim. We're all victims. Retail sales tax are the lar is the largest revenue generator for local governments and the second largest for the state of Illinois. It, it is, frankly, as, as re goes retail, so goes state of Illinois and those units of local government and the services we all rely upon. Um, just on using the very, very conservative estimate of a $60 billion problem nationwide, uh, Illinois would be losing about uh, $200 million in sales tax uh, just on that very conservative estimate. Now, in a press conference last week, Mayor Lightfoot said Chicago retailers have not done enough themselves to stop retail crime. Here she is. But we've also got to push retailers. Some of the retailers downtown in Michigan Avenue, I will tell you, I'm disappointed that they're not doing more to take safety uh, and make it a priority. For example, we still have retailers that won't institute um, plans like having security officers in their stores, making sure um, that they've got cameras that are actually operational. Rob, what's your response to what the mayor just said? I think those comments are extraordinarily unfortunate. As we've said many times, they're misinformed. Uh, and again, as we, as we, you and I noted just a few minutes ago, what we see on the news every day shows that that just isn't accurate. We see the camera footage. We see them blowing past armed security guards. We saw what happened to Joe Perillo's auto dealers just earlier this week. Uh, and those are only the most recent example. And we know it's not happening just on Mag Mile. It's happening in retail quarters all over the city, whether it's in Little Village or, or other areas around uh, the city in Cook County. Uh, it just simply isn't an accurate statement. Okay. Uh, a complicated situation, it sounds like. Rob Carr from the Illinois Retail Merchants Association, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Up next, a preview of the Bears' next matchup, but first, a look at the weather. Rumors are swirling about the future of the Bears organization as big changes loom. Meanwhile, the team has to contend with all three coordinators potentially missing Monday night's game against the Minnesota Vikings due to COVID. And joining us as always is James Big Cat Williams, former offensive lineman for the Chicago Bears from 1991 to 2002. A big cat, I'm remote, so I can't see you, but it's always great to have you. I want to start with, uh, there's a couple reports this week that the Bears were talking to a former Bear, a former teammate of yours, Trace Armstrong, about potentially coming in and being an executive with the team. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, you know, I heard, I heard the rumors. I also heard the statement that Trace put out there as far as, you know, the, it wasn't true. But I think that's a direction that they need to go. I mean, even if it's not Trace, you have enough uh, players that have played for the Bears that are intelligent enough, that know football, that are still involved in, you know, football in some sort of way that could help the organization out. Um, you know, Trace, Trace was young when I got here. And, you know, he was one of the guys that kind of took me under his wing and showed me the ropes. And I think he's the reason why I got moved to offense. At least that's what he'll tell you and Steve McMichaels will tell you. But, um, you know, he knows the game. He's, he's a representative right now of actually Matt Nagy as far as being an agent. So, you know, he, he, he would be a good choice, but it wasn't something that he said that he's talked to the organization about. And there was this really in-depth article in the Tribune this week about what you just mentioned, that there are all these uh, Bear alumni that have had great success either in coaching or management, and it doesn't seem like the Bears consult these alumni uh, very much. Is, is that a weak spot here for the organization? Uh, I think so. 
I think so. I think when you think about the major organizations, they're trying to do anything possible to turn their franchise into a team that can win for multiple years. You don't want just the one Super Bowl and done or a couple playoffs appearances. You want to be that team that can sustain winning for a long period of time. And when you look at these or the organizations that are able to do that, these are organizations that, you know, their offensive coordinators, their defensive coordinators, their quarterback coaches are people that are wanted around the league to be head coaches, to move up in position. And when you're talking about organizations like that, you know, let's just say New England. Uh, they're able to replace those people with other good people. And, you know, that's just kind of what they do. So you'd like the Chicago Bears to put themselves in a situation where, you know, people are coming in trying to steal all of their coordinators to put them in head coaching jobs because they are that good. And it's just the same carousel every four to five years. Hire, fire coaches and general managers, and they just can't get any consistency. One spot that they hope there's consistency with now is at the quarterback with Justin Fields, but against Green Bay, uh, he was roughed up a lot, as he's been roughed up in every game. How do the Bears keep him upright against uh, Minnesota on Monday? Well, I think, first of all, you don't come out and just don't start the game in empty sets. Um, you know, the line has struggled a little bit and not all their fault. Uh, you know, he holds on to the ball a little long at times, but these are things that you know, and these are things that you can kind of work around. Do you, can you bring an extra tight end? You got five tight ends on your roster. Let's use some of those guys to block and then get them out late into routes. Uh, you know, the backs chipping, play action, being able to run the ball. You know, they only ran the ball two times as far as handoffs in the second half of that Green Bay game. And when you're built like the Bears are built and you're not really sure what your identity is, you got to take as much pressure off of that offensive line and that quarterback as you can. And the quarterback clearly has loads of, loads of talent, but is there any threat that all of this futility is getting to his head and it's going to affect his development? I think there's always a threat of that, especially when you're talking about a guy that has come out of college. He's used to winning. All he's done is won. And, you know, now he's going through a period where he's just not sure what's going on. Uh, he, he, the, the coaching staff, the play on the field, the plays that are designed, uh, it doesn't really seem to be um, formatted around him. So you have to hope that they bring in somebody that can make him feel comfortable. But I think that when you listen to Justin Fields talk, you're, you're listening to a guy that is very confident in himself, that has the ability to bounce back like game, after the Cleveland game. You know, we saw him bounce back. These are right. traits you want in your quarterback. Right, he seems mentally tough. Uh, on the other side of the ball, the defense has to contend with Dalvin Cook, the running back, uh, what, do, what do you make of this matchup on defense on Monday? Well, it's going to be interesting. Uh, you're talking about a team that wants to physically push the ball down your throat, and Minnesota has the ability to do that. Now, you know, with COVID and players out for injuries, they're going to be just as depleted as the Bears are going to be. So I think the Bears have to be able to run the ball early to open up some of those things in the secondary. And if the Bears can do that and defensively, they can put some pressure on Minnesota to force them to stop running the ball, then we're talking about, you know, them possibly being able to squeak one out. So I'm going to go 21-20. I'm going to go Bears this week. I got my fingers crossed, man. I, I think they can pull one off. All right, that'll be a nail biter. And our thanks as always to James Big Cat Williams. Thanks so much. Thanks, Paris. And there's more Chicago tonight just ahead, but first, a look at some weekend events around town.
now we check back in with Joanna Hernandez, who spent the day in Grand Boulevard as part of our In Your Neighborhood series. Joanna. Brandis, I'm now here with Cleophis Lee, Director of Violence Prevention and Intervention of Centers for New Horizon. The organization works across the city, but is based here in Grand Boulevard. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. So I want to start off. Can you tell us about Centers for New Horizons work, especially here in, in Grand Boulevard? Yeah, um, Centers for New Horizons, we have about a 50 year history. And as a matter of fact, we're celebrating 50 years um, this year. And um, in the community specifically, we um, we do work around centered around child care. Um, we also do work around uh, workforce development, working with individuals to help them to um, obtain employment, uh, vocational training, as well as some violence prevention work that we do um, within the community as well. And talking about that, you're most involved in violence prevention and intervention programs. Can you tell us about that and how does your day to day look like? Yeah. So. Um, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that our city is ravaged right now with violence. Um, and so, you know, the, the work that we're doing, we have a street outreach team. And if I can give a shout out to, to um, the city Department of Public Health. Um, who is funding us? Um, they're they're working to prevent uh, some of the violence that's taking place within the community. They develop relationships with some of the various, I'm gonna say, organizations, if you would, for lack of a better term, um, and then work to like mediate um, various situations, circumstances. When there's a shooting that takes place, um, our street outreach team they go and um, they respond to that situation, as well as when uh, victims have certain things that's going on with them, whether they're shot. Um, from that, you know, they they need. Um, um, mental health services. Um, they may need some employment. We respond and assist them with that as well. And you take a trauma informed approach. So yes. you were talking a little bit about that trauma. Can you tell me, can you share what that experience is like yes. when you get there and you're involved and you talk to the people who are involved in, in shootings? Yes. So basically, the trauma informed care approach is looking at um, an individual's trauma experience that they face, which then informs us on the best ways to approach um, servicing these individuals. Now, this week there was a federal hearing on gun violence in Chicago. This comes as a city and cities across the city face rise in gun, gun violence. As someone working on the ground, what do you, do you think that communities need to address? So, I, I believe in self-reliance. Um, so, number one, I, I believe that if communities are really going to pull themselves out of um, these violent situations. First and foremost, we have to uh, address things that we can address on our own, such as number one, keeping our, our communities clean. That that's one. Um, working with the city and making sure that lights are on, um, and then also taking responsibility for the lives of our young people, uh, mentoring our young people, working with them to help them to develop the skills that they need in order to, you know, have and live a successful life. Um, and and then also, you know, I, I just believe as well resources are important um, being able to uh, uh, pour into our communities economically so that you know individuals can have a sense of pride as it pertains to their community you mentioned before we started this interview that you're very passionate about the work that you do mm -hmm. what drives you to do this work every day because I because I can only imagine it, it can be intense uh, your day-to-day -day work yeah um, basically I'm a lover of life um, and I want others to experience life. I don't think that a, a four-year-old child should have their life cut short and have yet to experience any forms of life. I don't think that a senior who is, you know, in their 70s or 80s should um, be afraid to step outside of their home because of the possibility that they may be mugged or robbed or killed or, or whatnot. Um, so just being a lover of life, um, I, I love life and I want others to be able to experience life as well. And when you hear about high crime in the area or just in the community, you know, what is the over and over what are those thoughts that go through your mind what more can i do <laughs> that that's kind of it what more can i do um i simply go into strategy mode um what what who can i you know build more relationships with what other resources can you know we identify to you know um help us get this work done well thank you so much for joining us tonight thank you thank you again he is the director for prevention and intervention at centers of new horizon here at the grand boulevard brandis Joanna, a lot of work looks like it's going on in Grand Boulevard, and it also looks like you're in a garden. Uh, what can you tell us about where you all set up shop tonight? 
Okay, how awesome is this beautiful piece of art right behind me? I learned about it today, actually. It's very nice, and my photographer lit it up very, very nicely. You can see all the detail work here. Now, we're at the gallery, Guchard's Great Migration Sculpture Garden. It's located on the grounds of what used to be the Ben Franklin Department Store, the first African-American-owned department store here in the country. And that's what's so amazing about this neighborhood. I learned so much. There was many firsts, and as I started there, as I began, there are so many stories here to tell of what impacted them here in the neighborhood. But that is all for us here on Grand Boulevard. I send it back to you. Nice work to you and the team, Joanna. Thanks. We'll see you later. And we're back to wrap things up in just a few moments. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. And that is our show for this Thursday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. You can also get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com slash news. And you can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night, live at 7, for the Week in Review. And now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Brandis Friedman. Thanks for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible in part by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, wishing all a happy and healthy holiday season.